Generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity, a podcast slash show monstrosity dedicated to bringing my love of science fiction in all its wondrous insanity to you, the viewer. And standing in for the layman is my assistant Steve, the lovable science illiterate that I am going to be educating on the finer points of nerd culture. Say hello, Steve. Hello. Classic intro, never changes. Today, we have a wonderful topic to get into. Alexander Kerensky, the man, the myth, the legend, the biggest Giga Chad in the history of Battletech. But first, shill, Steve. Shill like your life depends on it. Uh, we have a Patreon. We said this last time. Okay, I stop. Think. Cancel. You're, you're, okay. you're, you're canceled. This is terrible. We'll have to undergo remedial training and your food supplies have been docked for the next month trash no no <laughs> we have a patreon if you'd like to support science insanity and gain access to unedited versions of our videos a day early then head on over there and check it out links are down in the description of the video and will be in a pinned comment at the well top of the comment section there are many jokes rants and relatively inappropriate things that we have to cut out for youtube so if you'd like to get the full uncensored science insanity full frontal go check it out and also, because nobody answered the question last time and we have to do this right at the beginning for a monstrous introduction, gaming. Me and Steve both play a lot of video games and we're both relatively interested in science fiction stuff. Mech Warrior, Warhammer 40k, all of that wonderful stuff including old style games like Star Wars Empire at War and Homeworld and stuff. If you'd be interested in seeing that kind of stuff, potentially on the main channel or maybe on a second channel, let us know in the comments down below. Shout out my boy David Gabe. He's That's... getting a shout out at the beginning and end of the video. I don't care. He's getting it. He's special. Holds a special I... place in my heart. Uh... The first one to feed me. Okay, fair enough. Yep. The he, congratulations. Since you're first man in, you get a shout out at the beginning. But we can't do this for everyone, Steve. If we have it, like he is, he's the only one that's getting this treatment. So. Yes. If we have like a hundred people that are in the patrons, we we can't shout them all out at the beginning. It's got to be the end, or we're never getting anything done. Yeah. And, and, I mean, that's what I said. Yep, this guy's yep. getting a shout out at the beginning and the end. Speaking so. speaking of never getting things done, we actually need to move on because we are. Oh God, four minutes never in. Never getting things done. Never getting things done. Yeah. Yikes. Okay, so like I mentioned, we are talking about Alexander Kerensky today, the almighty man himself, the dude who built the Atlas, who designed the King Crab among like four other ridiculously over-the-top assault mechs, the dude who literally held humanity and the Star League together through the worst civil war ever, and who led the exodus of the SLDF into deep space and ended up creating the clans. Just like Comstar and, well, the Age of Strife and War and all that crap that came before, just like the SLDF, it's like the convergence of all of Battletech lore. Basically everything in current day Battletech stems from the actions of this one man and the fact that he basically changed the galaxy. He is fantastic and I love him. He's great. He's also bald, which is, I, that's not really important, but it's just another fact we'll throw out there. It's not very good for the soup stock, I'll tell you that much, but... <laughs> It's perfectly fine, I assure you. It makes absolutely no difference. Alexander Kerensky's early life was relatively boring. The legend he would become truly began to take shape when he studied at the Tharkad Capital University, basically excelling at everything and proving that he was the Chad to everyone else's virgin. He showed an incredible proclivity and skill for basically everything leaning towards warfare, outclassing pretty much everyone else that he was in the same class with. This notable skill earned him a place in a facility called the Nagelring, which is a really weird name, and if you're going to laugh at it, get it out of the way now, Steve, because we got stuff to I, cover. I shall not laugh at it now. <laughs> I shall laugh at it later. If you start randomly laughing, like, five minutes down the line, I'm going to slap you through the screen. I'm like, going to have to do it now. Oh my <laughs> god, I shouldn't have opened my stupid mouth. Like I was trying to say, a top-of-the-line and ultra-modern academy built by the Star League as part of an initial outreach and integration program for the Lyrian Commonwealth. The Nagel Ring was a colossal academy meant to educate and train entire armies worth of new personnel for the Star League. Everything from starship crews, to aerospace asset pilots, to battle mech pilots, to infantry, artillery, and even logistics officers. Literally everything that an army 
army would need to invade another planet on the other side of the universe for oil, uh, freedom. Freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course. And of course, when Kerensky earned his way in, he excelled. Quickly proving to be one of the best in the academy, Kerensky not only crushed his fellow classmates in exercises and tests, but also often T-posed on them outright during mock battles and skirmishes, humiliating multiple contenders that threatened or, uh, not threatened, tried to prove he wasn't the almighty man of men. I should also mention that this school... In Battletech, you can go to school to learn how to pilot a building-sized war machine. Screw your trade school giving you industry experience, straight into the trash with your bachelor's or master's degree. My school lets me take an applied bachelor's in war crimes. This is the greatest thing ever. It's the pinnacle of schools. I don't think you can get better than that in that uni in uh, this universe or any. Modern schools are like hacking off auto shop and wood shop because that shit's too dangerous. You can't leave our stupid modern day children alone with a handsaw. Meanwhile, in BattleTech, they're like, "Oh yeah, sixteen year old Jimmy, have fun with the fifty billion dollar war machine. Make sure not to step in it on any civilians when you're out for a walk." It's great, man. It's like the entire setting is living in the 1950s. Oh yeah, kid, just go play on the three-story jungle gym. What's the worst yeah. that could happen? I mean, th certainly nothing could go wrong. Honestly, I don't actually know if anything did go wrong. There wasn't really any information on that. I assume See, no not. Proof. Yeah, th th there's no legal proof to bring a case against them, so lawsuit free. Now, of course, graduating a few years later, Kerensky joined the SLDF, most likely because he saw the colossal military-industrial complex an ungodly level of military might and thought, yes, that'll do. He said, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> Kerensky began to rapidly rise through the ranks. A mix of charisma, political skill, and pure, unadulterated, I am going to get shit done energy carried Kerensky in his early days, basically becoming the guy people went to when they needed something done. Pirates harassing trade routes, Kerensky was already on top of it encountering their ragtag mech forces. Politicians starting pointless wars over who gets the last slice of cake, Kerensky was busy draining their swamp before you even asked and kicking their ass to the curb. Traders and secessionists trying to overthrow the- No. No. Just no. No? No. Yeah, you, you won't get that, but we'll explain it later. So, his early career went by incredibly fast and hard. Man basically never stopped fighting, never stopped moving up the ranks. And speaking of, let's talk about his first real war. The first major test of Kerensky's medal in a real no-holds-barred, inner-sphere-style throwdown. The War of Davion's Succession. Now, I need to explain this real quickly so you can at least understand the political tomfoolery going on. So, you know how the great houses have, like, de facto nobility in charge, and when the king or queen or whatever dies, the son takes over with the great houses and all that? Yeah. Yeah, so you all that wonderful medieval stuff. Unfortunately for House Davion, they had a little bit of an issue where some of their wayward sons and daughters would go off and get married for stupid, ridiculous things like love or attraction or why the hell not? It beats being here in the palatial court as the replacement to the heir. God, people still do that these days? Come on now. Yeah, I know, it's ridiculous, We've moved right? past that as a society. It's absolutely disgusting. One of these children of Davion went off to go marry a noble, or like a minor noble from the Draconis Combine. And this what? was a big no. Yeah, so both of them were minor nobles, they weren't really significant, but unfortunately this raises a colossal problem, because that person was still an heir to the Davion throne. The Caritan noble was not. They were just a random, like, low-down Draconis Combine noble, so they weren't particularly important. But now, all of a sudden, despite the fact that Davion disowned this wayward kid, they had produced a child that was legally capable of fighting for the Davion succession, their throne, and they were basically in the pocket of the Draconis Combine. And you can see where this political tomfoolery was going, can't you? Yeah, I can see a little bit of an issue there. Um, kind of seems like a little bit of conflict of interest, I'm not sure. Oh, oh yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a problem. So, 
The Draconis Combine claimed that this child was now the rightful and legitimate heir to the Davian throne after several other high-ranking members of the noble family suffered unfortunate and untimely demises, and this led to war immediately. Now keep in mind, House, House Davion and the Federated Sons in general were having absolutely none of this. They, they were fully united behind the current leader and the current successor, and they saw this as the blatant ploy for power that it was. So they were fully united against the Draconis Combine, but the Draconis Combine was basically ready to throw hands and start an all-out war. And normally, this is where the SLDF would get involved in order to stop this kind of thing from escalating. Unfortunately, they didn't, because the leader at the time, the first lord of the Star League, was kind of busy having semi-drug-induced uh, prophetic visions of his entire world burning. So he was like... He was busy having fun. Yeah, he, he was kind of he was kind of doing his thing. Which is a bit of an issue, you know, you kind of roll the dice, you get an incompetent or crazy leader, so it is what it is, you just have to deal with it. And the Star League basically dragged its heels for months, doing absolutely nothing while this began to escalate into a full-scale war. Eventually, after severe fighting and threat of a full-scale war between the Great Houses breaking out, they finally acted. Five SLDF divisions invaded the region where the fighting was heaviest, and landed on the five main planets that, dr that the Draconis Combine and the Federated Suns were fighting over. Kerensky commanded one of these divisions, the one that landed on the planet Royal. This daring action shocked the Great Houses into inaction, because when the SLDF came by, originally they were planning on, you know, contacting the Great Houses, being like, yo, we're here, just so you know, we're gonna stop the conflict now, basically pulling a UN, announcing what they were gonna do beforehand. Instead... And then proceeding not to do it? Oh, no, 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 no. They, they didn't proceed to just not do it. They just didn't tell anybody that they were going to do it. They changed the plans, oh, okay. didn't tell anybody, and rushed their military in there. They landed on these worlds and basically began punching the teeth in of anyone they could find that didn't immediately stand down, surrender, or move back to whatever safe zones slash designated areas they were supposed to be in. And like I said, this shocked Seems the Seems very reasonable. Yeah, I mean, this this shocked the Great Houses so much that they just, like, stopped fighting. House Davion in general was like, whoa, okay, hands up, dude, I'm gonna back off this way now. Have fun with the Draconis Combine. Finger guns as they backed away. And that was pretty much the end of that. Like, the Federated Sons wanted no more to do with it. For the most part, the SLDF was unopposed. They smashed through whatever defending forces were in place, and in particular, humiliating the Cretan forces when on the world they tried to resist as fiercely as they could and basically re-gear their entire front line to oppose the Star League. It did not work. Kerensky outmaneuvered and utterly destroyed them. It was barely a fight. It was closer to an outright slaughter. In fact, Part of the reason why Kerensky was able to command so effectively is because unlike most generals who would be incredibly high ranking in order to lead this amount of force, Kerensky was not sitting in a bunker somewhere. He was leading the battle personally from the front in his heavily modified Orion heavy battle mech. In fact, I don't think you know what the Orion looks like, so let me go find a picture of it. That's a picture of the Orion. It's pretty good. Also, quick fun fact, the Orion is like the one of the first heavy mechs that was ever made. It, it was the first one that was designed canonically in the lore and remains active even in modern day Battletech because it was an incredibly rugged, incredibly well-designed mech. It looks like it was one of the first ones ever made. Yeah, it's... Look, okay... It's fugly. Let's just get that out of the way. It's a fugly looking mech. It's lopsided. It's weird from certain angles. The gun that's in the right torso kind of looks like a dick. But we're like, what are you going to do about it? You just you just kind of got to deal with it. It's a first generation battle mech. You take the punches as they come and you keep going. Functionality over looks, I mean. Function over form. This is true. After this battle, and after Kerensky basically thrashed the Draconis Combine, utterly humiliating them and destroying like an entire division worth of their forces... He began his stunning rise to power. 
During the War of Davian succession, Kerensky was only a colonel, but over the next, like, seven-ish years, he would shoot through the ranks, eventually becoming the second in command of the entire Star League Defense Force and a hefty chunk of the logistics and military industrial base that supplied it. That seems good. Uh, yeah, he, he basically became military god. Like, I own this military now, this is mine. And... A year later, when his actual superior, the only other person that had more authority than him, kicked the bucket, he ascended to be the supreme commander of the entire Star League, basically unchallenged in his authority. Could go one of two ways. It, it, it went the good way. Yeah, it uh, it took eight years for that. Like, could you could you imagine? Could you imagine, like, a 30-year-old as the supreme leader of the United States Armed Forces. Like, that's basically what he did. No, no, not even that. Well, well, you see, we have rules and regulations against such things. You have to be 35. Okay. (laughs) So, by this point, his authority was absolute, right? He was at, like, the pinnacle. And, ironically enough, his power could only get greater from there. He only he could only go up. There is no down for this up. man. There, there, he's he's permanently on an upslope, man. This guy will never hit a peak ever. So the first Lord of the Star League at this point was basically a child, since his father, the um, crazy prophetic dream having dude before, he he's dead. He died. So that's it. Is what it is. Fair enough. And Kerensky. His stuff happens, and Kerensky was made the child's ward. He was the commander of the SLDF and had total authority to do anything, like we've said. And he had beaten the great houses into submission at every turn when they acted out, courting an enormous amount of political favor with them as he solved problems for them. He was also extremely beloved and respected by basically everyone, because if you served with him, not only did he respect you, treat you fairly, and not, like, throw your lives away, but he went through huge amounts of reforms and stuff to change the Star League from the nepotistic base that it had with the great houses and nobility into almost a pure meritocracy. If you were good at your job, you would excel and move up the ladder, and Kerensky guaranteed that it was equal opportunity and respect for everyone. So people loved this man. Even his enemies respected and feared him. And now, not only all of that, but he also had basically the king of humanity in his back pocket to raise as if it was his own child being his ward. This dude was literally like one step away from basically becoming the emperor of mankind in all but name if he wanted to be, and if he was willing to do the political skullduggery to get there. Guts, glory, and mad gains forever. Instead of seizing de facto power, he went about that colossal reformation, all of those overhauls and stuff, the SLDF, like I said. He destroyed corruption wherever he could find it, removed inefficient and divisive policies and bureaus in the SLDF. He weeded out the inept and unnecessary, got rid of people who were only in it for their own gain, or who would be padding their back pocket, or who just straight up didn't do their jobs properly, and got as close as possible as you could get to a meritocracy while still having a king in charge. And he spent a huge amount of his time organizing war games and unity building exercises so that after his multi-year long reforms ended, the SLDF was arguably utterly loyal, incredibly effective, and borderline the greatest force humanity had ever created and that currently had to offer. He also instituted a number of programs that would basically come to define the future of Battletech, such as reinforcing multiple assault and heavy mech building programs to create iconic mechs like the Atlas, which around now is when he actually designs it. And let me... Let me just let me just find a quote of this if I can, because it is genuinely one of the most hilarious things I have ever seen. Oh, here we go, here we go, okay. So, Kerensky, when describing the specifications and design for the new Atlas battle mech, and I quote, A mech as powerful as possible, as impenetrable as possible, and as ugly and foreboding as conceivable, so that fear and disgust itself will be our ally. So remember how we talked about the Atlas was a stupid, like, trash can with a bowling ball head? It was designed to be, it was designed to be ugly. Not only was it born ugly, it was meant to be that way. It's best they life. They accomplished their goal. I mean. They, in fact, did. 
So, by the end of all of this, the SLDF was just a monstrous force of nature. And they also had the Black Watch as part of their forces, and I feel like they alone justify the statement that the SLDF was unstoppably badass. The sun means nothing. Get out of my swamp, I will beat you to death with my own severed arm and flip you off with the other while doing it. You, you have no idea what that means, but people who are familiar with the Black Watch lore will understand those references. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, and they will understand that as well. The Black Watch is going to be a totally separate video because they deserve it, so we're not going to be talking too much about them. I'm just going to leave that as a tease hanging in the middle of the video. Moving so on. Make sure you tune in for that episode when yeah. we do it. Indeed. Moving on. So, aside from managing the SLDF, Kerensky also managed most of the Star League's bureaucracy and decision making. And ultimately, this was the biggest misstep he ever made, because it meant he had little time to care for the child lord of the Star League. This meant that he was vulnerable to infiltration and manipulation, and this is where Stefan Amaris comes in. Amaris is responsible for everything going wrong. Everything. You will learn to everything. hate him. You, you, you will learn to hate him. He, he is just... I already hate him. He, sp he says his name wrong. Shut up. Amaris spent years, essentially, wait, how, how, how do, okay, when I wrote this as a bullet point, I was just going, but I don't want to say this word, because it's super, you know what, whatever, he's the creepy uncle type that makes your skin crawl, let's just go with it. So Amaris spent I... years, essentially, grooming Richard Cameron to be the most trusting, incompetent, and blind leader he could keeping him firmly in his pocket and poisoning the young lord against everything else in his court, and most importantly, against Kerensky. Amaris did this because he's just the worst. The, like, the Capellans are objectively the wrong faction for terrible people, and Stefan Amaris is the worst of the worst people who has been the most wrong in all of human history. He was also a fugly fat pudding cup shaped bundle of lard and ambition. He also has a Fu Manchu mustache, and it's great. I love it. It's really, really funny. I, I, I gotta get, I gotta get you some pictures of good old Amaris, because my god. All I know is you came out with a bunch of accusations there. That's all <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh my god, he, he is a, he is a fugly man. Let me, let me find a picture of him real quick. Here, here's one picture of him. This is redone artwork that does him a lot better. But even in this, he's still. Still oh, really it. ugly. Yeah, don't worry. I got Man's some more. Man's been deformed. <laughs> Man's been deformed. Bro, look this. at that head shape. He's got a point on it. <laughs> He's got a bit of a cone head. That's true. He just it's fine. This is what he used to look like. He used to be worse. Hey, at least the head was rounded. I mean... Oh my god, it's so bad. Hey god, we got- I got another image. This is- this is one of Kerensky standing behind Amaris, and it's just a stupid looking image. It's just- it's just great. What? I... Amaris spent his time doing all of this because he wanted power. Ever since the Star League invaded his home nation all the way back during the War of Unification, his home being the Rimworld Republic, he wanted in. Ironically, he didn't want revenge, mostly. He didn't truly care about his own people or his nation as an independent state. He only truly cared for himself and his personal power and any loyalty or boons or political grandstanding that he did to sway anyone to his side was exactly that, to sway people to his side, not because he actually cared or believed in it. He's basically the very definition of a power-hungry despot. He is the kind of man he that... He if, looks like one, too. Yeah, he, he's the kind of dude where if he could become king by burning his own children alive, he absolutely would, no hesitation. So, with years of manipulation and coercion, by the time the Star League had its first Lord rise to power after, you know, coming of age, Amaris had manipulated him into creating the perfect situation for a civil war. However, Amaris was crafty. He moved all of his loyalist forces into Terran hegemony space to, um, protect the First Lord and move the SLDF forces out, to the great protest of Kerensky. So when it all I... happened, Amaris walked into the chamber of the First Lord, the giant council chamber with the high throne and stuff, right? He walked 
right through all of the security with four bodyguards behind him, fully armed. Normally, it is highly illegal to have any weapons whatsoever in the presence of the First Lord or anywhere near them. This guy was basically so manipulative that Cameron just let him through the door, let him through all the security with multiple loaded weapons. He walked into the chamber, walked up to the First Lord, and presented him a gift. When the First Lord opened the gift, he saw it was a truly beautiful laser pistol. Gold and encrusted with diamonds and precious gems. The entire thing. The most ostentatiously ridiculous thing possible. Amaris casually picked up the gun, allowed it to shine in the light of the room, marveled at it as he held it up for a few moments, then leveled it directly at the First Lord's head and pulled the trigger, killing him on the spot. That is a scene. That that is like that, the that is like that, the that is in fact one of the scenes of all time right there. <laughs> it's it's like the one time he did anything cool. It's like the one time that he was actually a cool villain rather than just a fat incompetent lard ass. I just I I hate him. He's the worst. He's he ruined everything. He ruined everything. Literally. That is what he's known for. Stefan Amaris. He ruined everything. He's like the Capellans squared. It's awful. Squared, oh god. Magnitude, we're reaching magnitudes of Capellan that shouldn't be possible. <laughs> well, one's already a stretch. I'm not sure that one should be possible. And yeah. now we're at two? Our, our shields can't repel Capellans of that magnitude. <laughs> Oh my god. By the time Kerensky learned of what happened, it was already too late to stop Amaris from entrenching himself in the core of human space. But you see, Kerensky wasn't an idiot. And what people don't seem to understand, specifically these kind of smooth brain wannabe dictators, is that he's the kind of man that sees the impossible and calls it a minor inconvenience to be overcome. Calls that a normal Tuesday. Calls that a normal... <laughs> normal Tuesday. It's normal every day. This dude is basically the one man that's going to hold humanity together over the next coming years. You see, Amaris had moved so much of his forces from the Rim World's Republic into the Inner Sphere and the Terran Hegemony more specifically, that stretching the supply lines of his loyalists and military so, so far across the Lyrian Commonwealth and the Inner Sphere in general, that there was basically nothing left to protect them or the Rimworld's Republic. So when Amaris contacted Kerensky and basically asked him to bend the knee and surrender the Star League, the entirety of human space waited with bated breath as Kerensky calmly, decisively said, no, I will not accept this. And that was the moment that the Star League Civil War officially began. And that's the significance from, like, way earlier ago when it was, like, traitors and stuff. No. Definitive no. This will not be happening. And unlike most people who would have responded like this, Kerensky absolutely had the power to. Because, you see, there was a lot of Star League forces that were kind of on the fence about this. Because most of them hated the First Lord as well. He was an incompetent moron, and he ran the Star League terribly. He would have run them into the ground if left to his own devices. So, in a way, his death was kind of the best thing that happened to him. But regardless, what the SLDF did respect and love, however, was Kerensky. If that man told them they're going to war, then the entirety of the SLDF would have. They were simply going to war. <laughs> if he says jump, they say how high. Like, he, he said, okay, SLDF, we're leaving, and they left with him. Which is a stunning level of control and respect to have over your men. So yeah, that was the beginning, that is like the definitive beginning of the Star League Civil War. Now, Amaris would try to gain Kerensky's loyalty several more times, but ultimately failed. And in 2767, the Civil War kicked off with its first actions. In response to the usurpation of the Star League, the SLDF under Kerensky began to heavily target the loyalists and resources of Amaris and the Rimworld's Republic. Now, I want you to take a wild, wild guess what Kerensky's plan was when he learned about the tactical situation and why he went after the Rimworld's Republic. Because that's, uh, yeah. Fuck. Okay, well, hilariously incompetent, but don't worry, I shall yes. explain. I shall explain for everybody and your benefit. 
because Amaris had committed basically everything straight towards this invasion and this coup, the reality was he had nothing left. That was everything in Terran hegemony space. And a few probing attacks on hegemony worlds proved that Amaris had dug in so heavily that the SLDF could probably dig him out right away, but it would be at an ultimately absolutely unacceptable loss of life and materiel for the Star League. So instead, Kerensky so figured... do that when you can simply go around? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, he didn't okay. Go, he quiet. didn't go around yet. He will. He'll, he'll encircle the entirety of Amaris space in, in a little bit. But for now, Kerensky went, okay, you, you want to squat in my home? You want to piss on my rug? You want to be that goddamn dog from down the street? Okay, Amaris, fine. I, I will treat you to your own hospitality. I will burn your goddamn home to the ground and salt the fields of everyone you've ever known. I will erase your culture from the face of this galaxy, is basically what ended up happening. Because Kerensky took the SLDF and obliterated the Rimworld's Republic ability to resist. Considering that they were basically undefended, the SLDF moved in, destroyed all of Amaris's supply lines, blew up every single factory and industrial base they could find, dropping the sun on many cities that tried to resist, and ultimately crippled the Rimworld's Republic. Basically taking that nation and reducing its entire industry back to zero. There is nothing they can do to support Amaris anymore. There will be no more soldiers, no more ammunition, no more mechs, nothing coming from yeah. your loyalist space. Your loyalist no space... No more logistics for you. No, <laughs> no more logistics. You don't get logistics anymore. Period. It's over. <laughs> Done. You've, you've lost your logistics privileges. Sorry. <laughs> your logistics privileges have been revoked. And literally, like, he just... He rendered it ash. And it only took about a year and a half to conquer dozens of worlds and completely destroy the support lines that Amaris had to try to keep his what basically turned into an invasion at this point going. And you see, in a lot of ways, this right here is the death knell of Amaris Karen uh, Amaris. This is what killed him. Amaris Karensky. I just I misspoke. <laughs> Shut up. This this is oh my god. So this is what killed Amaris, because now he was forced to rely on logistics and industry that was not set up to support him, and that was actively against him. The Terran hegemony may be under his military occupation, but the population was not. They did not support him. Widespread civic unrest, partisan activity, resistance from basically all strata of society was extreme, and even worse, on most of these worlds, there were still large garrisons of SLDF forces that remained after the initial attack. Because you see, Kerensky couldn't take all the SLDF with him on these initial fake patrols and war games. Some of them had to stay behind to garrison worlds. That was just how it works, right? The, the military can't pick up everything and move. It's got to leave some shit behind. So what Amaris did was ambush all of these bases and supply depots and everything and blow everything to hell. He dropped many, many nukes on many SLDF garrisons that he didn't outright ambush and destroy with conventional forces. And this was a colossally bad idea, because not only did he destroy most of the military equipment that was in these bases, but many of these soldiers escaped, that were trained and still armed with battle mechs or anti-personnel weaponry or all of this stuff that they could then train and distribute among the populace. So not only was Amaris fighting a large-scale guerrilla war across most of the Terran hegemony, but now his supply lines were cut and all of the factories and production in the Terran hegemony most likely would have been inefficient to support him or ineffective to replace losses. He was screwed. Surely these oversights will never come back to harm him. Oh, of, of course not. So the Rimworld's Republic basically got drop kicked straight out of the setting, and after regrouping and consolidating all available forces, Kerensky launched Operation Chieftain, a campaign intended to reconquer the entire Terran hegemony. And how he went about doing this is basically by going, I don't want to see a single square inch of territory not under assault at any given time. 
If there is a place to put boots on the ground, there will be boots there, so help me God. He surrounded the entirety of the Terran hegemony, bringing every available force that he could. Every single army corps in the entire SLDF, along with multiple from the Great Houses. Not all of them, not many of them, but enough to bolster forces here and there, because even if the Great Houses didn't really care who won, many of them still preferred Kerensky if he was going to be the one in charge. And considering that they Kerensky... They don't care, but they do care enough. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. If if it like they don't really care who's in charge, but if it comes down to a choice between good old Lardass over there and war hero Kerensky, they're gonna pick Kerensky, and we're we're gonna talk about that later. So they basically surrounded the entire Terran hegemony, a enormous like inner sphere spanning cordon of the entire Terran hegemony, and they moved in from every angle. He divided his forces up into three main groups, one to travel through each of the accommodating great houses towards the hegemony. In the early stages of the campaign, Kerensky's forces tore through the Outer Terran hegemony worlds. Amaris had tried to fortify them and attempted to create defensive hardpoints along the cities and stuff, but in many of the Outer Worlds, they weren't complete. They still exacted a very high price in lives and military equipment, but they didn't last very long. Kerensky's forces and the SLDF swept over them, destroying a large portion of Amaris' defending army in the opening months of the invasion. And Seems what... like a not very good recipe for success for Amaris, I don't know. Not great, yeah. He's sufferin suffering uh, pretty high levels of attrition here. But you see, what Kerensky had did... Some logistics. If only he had some logistics, yeah. But you see, Kerensky is channeling a little bit of actual real-life General Patton here. Because the moment, the moment that Amaris' forces tried to flee or retreat or regroup, he would abandon defensive positions, he would basically give up on any pre-prepared advances or stuff like that, and he would take that opportunity. The moment the enemy turned to run, he would take heavy and medium mech brigades and charge their rear as fast as he possibly could. It didn't matter if they were outrunning their ammunition or fuel or whatever, catch the enemy, keep pushing, never let them regroup. And whenever the Amaris forces broke, they basically surrendered colossal portions of the battlefield or even the, like colossal portions of the planet as they were chased across it. Kerensky basically was attriting Amaris's forces to an almost unacceptable level. Like th there was virtually no way that they could keep this up. The struggle could go on for quite a while, but with how things were working, there was little chance that Amaris would actually survive to see the end of this with any hope of actually winning. And this is how much of Operation Chieftain went, with Kerensky just destroying Amaris forces and strongholds wherever they came across and pushing deep into Terran hegemony space. There was many large battles that stand out, but we don't have time to go over all of them or really any of them. We're just going to talk about the actual battle of Terra itself, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the Exodus, and that's going to be the end, because we already talked about what Operation Exodus was when we talked about the clans. So, eventually, they finally made it to Terra. And on the 23rd of January, 2777, that's a lot of sevens, they began planning... Triple seven. Triple seven. They began planning Operation Liberation. That's a wonderful rhyme. The final phase of the operation to clear out the Terran hegemony from the Amaris filth. And the SLDF soldiers began staging from eight worlds all advancing towards Terra. They planned on completely overwhelming the rather impressive orbital defenses that Amaris had created and simply blitzing onto the planet. Because you see, Terra was surrounded by an incredibly impressive ring of orbital stations that were very heavily armed, as well as a not insignificant number of warships, both large and small, that Amaris had held back in reserve to defend the world as a final last-ditch effort. Amaris, along with that, had huge batteries of surface-to-space nuclear missiles all over the planet, and he was basically hoping that he could potentially make himself such a prickly target that maybe they would just surrender and let him keep that one planet. Let him have his one little empire of dirt in the middle of human space. 
<laughs> oh, that's pretty good there. That's a, <laughs> a lot of opium. Yeah, it's not great. It's uh, it's not great. Unfortunately, the problem is that many of these defenses were not geared from multiple directions of assault, right? They expected to be attacked from a couple different directions, maybe, and with a whole bunch of installations also on the moon, that was realistically their strong point, wherever, you know, these defenses were concentrated. By attacking from multiple directions, the SLDF swept through the solar system and basically destroyed all supporting equipment. These shipyards, any logistics hubs, any resources that might be spread out throughout Mars or Venus or the asteroid belt, destroying all of them to try to starve Terra and Amaris of all the supplies they possibly could in preparation for the final assault on Earth. And when it actually came, they attacked from like every direction. And when I mean every direction, I mean like literally every direction. North Pole, South Pole, all along the equator, all along every single like, um... It's that good old uh, History Channel series, Battle 360. Um, excellent series, by the way. Highly recommend all of y'all go watch it. Uh, it's like 360 cubed, because we're in space. There's three dimensions that you can attack from. So, the SLDF Navy basically destroyed these orbital defenses. Now keep in mind, they suffered horrific losses doing it, like they suffered a massive portion of their ships disabled or destroyed outright, but the rapid and devastating assault basically meant that Amaris had little time to respond. Those surface batteries barely got any shooting in, and much of the defenses were swept aside fast enough for the invasion to come up. Because you see, the strategy wasn't just to destroy the orbital facilities and then move in. No, 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 no. They weren't going to sweep up all of them and spend potentially, like, months fighting these things in orbit trying to stay alive. They were trying to blitz the planet as fast as possible. So the SLDF Navy would move in, clear a cordon straight down to the planet, and then the SLDF would land as many invasion forces as they can down that corridor, and then try to spread out from there, disabling any surface-to-space batteries and taking over as much of the planet as they could as quickly as they could. <laughs> Some good old-fashioned uh, blitzkrieg over here. If this was to turn into a slugging match, the SLDF would win. It was guaranteed by this point. But again, they would take so many casualties that didn't need to be taken. So instead, Kerensky decided success through audacity. We are going to shock the enemy moving so fast and so violently that we'll put them on the back foot and keep them there for the entire fight. And this honestly, is just an incredible fight. So, the actual invasion itself is split up into two main campaigns because that was where the defenses were most coordinated. When the invasion fleet was one hour away from Terra, flights of aerospace fighters were launched en masse in their thousands to take out key planetary batteries protecting the European and Asian continents. The fighters basically entered Terra's atmosphere at an especially steep angle, which means like 80 degrees. They're, they're going like straight at the planet, right? In an effort to... Pretty hot anyway. Yeah, basically dive bombers, man. Like World War II dive bombers. You're going straight oh, down. Put that meatball in your targets. Is more than that. 80 degrees is 10 off 90. That's not quite a straight dive. Yeah, the, the dive bombers dived at uh, 70 to 75. Huh, okay, so that is steeper then. All right, fair enough. Neat little <laughs> random tidbit there. So the reason that they did this is to make them less vulnerable to anti-air fire from defense batteries all over the ground. They still took incredibly heavy losses, of course, but the raw speed and audacity, again, of this invasion, the pure hammer blow that they struck, crippled entire sectors of Amaris's defensive formations, basically destroying any ability for them to fire back, because they were basically implying modern seed tactics. The moment an anti-air battery opened up on them, 
counter response forces would veer off and plow as many missiles and bombs straight into that target as they possibly could before again pivoting around to try to find more anti-aircraft batteries. The moment anyone opened fire on these initial aerospace assets, a hail of missiles would come down on them. This was both to suppress their ability to fire back and to figure out where enemy hard points were. And if there was particular tough formations that couldn't be broken by these rapid uh, response suppression of enemy air defense operations, then they simply left it alone, redirected the invasion fleet slightly so that they would land outside of their area of fire. And this proved to be extremely effective because despite extensive casualties and near failure in some cases, the fighters did succeed in destroying every single defensive installation around all of the initial landing zones, resulting in a completely uncontested landing for the SLDF forces. The warships, which couldn't stay to provide orbital fire support, moved off to a safe distance, and the fighters were recalled for the most part, except for like in-atmosphere assets, back up into orbit to maintain the cordon and rearm for future operations. And that was the initial part of the invasion. And when the actual land forces landed, oh baby did they. 30 full <laughs> divisions landed on Terra during the initial drop over an area stretching from Madrid to Magadan with the goal of capturing every major city and spaceport with the destruction of every defensive installation and all industrial and military hard points that they found. Yeah, I got a question. Where's uh, Magadan? Excellent question. Okay, so Madrid in Spain to Magadan. Oh my god, that's a Russian city? Seriously? All the way in the We're east. We confirmed not Russians here. That's, that's like all the way in the east. Dude, holy shit, that's the entire length of the, the continent. It's like from- Are we talking Kamchatka area? Or? It's the second most east province in all of Russia. It's like- Okay, all right. Yeah, it's, yeah it, it's insanely east. The, the next most east one is the one that's almost touching Alaska. Madrid in Spain, all the way to Magadan, eastern Russia. They landed forces all the way across the continent. That is an enormous invasion force to do something like that. So like I said, 30 divisions dropped onto the planet, and things immediately went SLDF, man. They were kicking ass. The landings were almost entirely unopposed, as the uh, the Rim Republican forces, which is, you know, Amaris's actual military forces, basically couldn't fight back. The few garrisoned positions that survived were pummeled into the dirt or easily driven off. However, Amaris would soon personally take control of the defense of what was left of his continent. And his skills as a strategist were garbage. He sucked. This dude's entire plan was shit to begin with, so you can imagine how terrible it would be when he took to the battlefield to heroically lead his troops. Probably a good idea to mention that he was, like, insane by this point. And I don't mean, like, Oh, he was always insane, he just made stupid dis- No, he, he's going actually clinically insane. The man is disassociating from reality, like, stupidly hard right now. And he was issuing some of the most asinine orders you can possibly believe. And Amaris... Oh boy, Amaris made wonderful decisions here. He basically pulled a Nazi Germany Battle of the Bulge. A final, desperate effort was made by forces under his command to create a massive counter-thrust spearhead basically straight against the heavy heart of the Star League invasion, throwing everything they had at the most defended, the most heavily armed part of the invasion. It did not go well. It went Who could have incredibly foreseen? badly. The 135th Royal Battle Mech Division basically butchered them before moving through what was left of the now pitiful Amaris Loyalists and towards Unity City. However, victory was not yet complete, as Amaris, realizing his terribly planned counteroffensive failed, had fled to the Imperial Palace deep, built deep within the Canadian wilderness. 
On September 29th, General Kerensky's second-in-command led forces of the 26th Royal Battle Mech Division in the capture of a nearby spaceport, and linking up with Kerensky, defeated the Republican garrison guarding the facility. Kerensky, his second-in-command, and two lances of battle mechs, which is eight mechs by the way, a lance is four mechs, made the final assault on the palace itself, destroying the last few pathetic armored pillboxes defending it, and generally sweeping aside the last of the resistance. And piloting his Orion mech, Kerensky personally punched the shit out of the palace door, knocking it down, and walking in to personally capture Stefan Amaris. Who wants to capture a guy? Just punch him in the face. I don't think the battle mech could actually make it into the palace. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure Kerensky. Well, you can if you break down all the walls. <laughs> I I don't I don't know if you want to bring the whole building down though. It, it, it's fine. It, it is what it is. It accomplishes what you're trying what you're trying to do one way or another. I mean, he either dies by building, dies by getting punched, dies uh, by building. <laughs> Stefan Amaris, death by building. We're almost done. We, we got we got one last like paragraph to go over and then we can start going insane because we've been going for like, I don't even know how long we've been going for. An hour and 20 oh, minutes. Know. Oh boy. Jesus. In the aftermath, Amaris, realizing he was royally screwed, finally gave the signal to surrender and he and a few thousand of what was left of his Republican troops were initially treated with respect as prisoners of war. As it turned out, Amaris had butchered the entire Cameron royal family, women, children, and infants included, and simply left them to rot in their chambers. Two weeks later, in the wake of the unimaginable outrage that followed, because while the actual First Lord at the time was kind of a douche and nobody liked him, House Cameron was still widely respected and loved overall. And in the wake of that outrage, Kerensky himself would travel to the scene of the crime, and after a few minutes of examining the throne room, Kerensky flew out to the hotel where Amaris was being held, and ordered him and his entire family executed by firing squad, standing watch over it until it had been completed. By the end of all of this, Kerensky had essentially won the war by himself. He was the Star League by this point, he was essentially the only figure of authority left. He had won the Civil War, he had rallied the entirety of humanity together, and he had beaten the Great Houses into submission, or at the very least cowed them enough to stay the hell out of his way. There were no legitimate heirs to the Star League throne anymore, there was nobody that could claim the regency or the lordship, and there was virtually no structures in place that could keep everything together, as the Great Houses were already getting ready to go after one another. And this is where things become almost a tragedy, because if Kerensky had been a more greedy person, if he had been less of the Chad he was, the Star League probably would have endured to continue on in this original form. But you see, Kerensky was an absolute loyalist. He truly, genuinely believed in the ideals and the mission of the Star League. And for him, his duty was to protect it. Not to benefit from its power, not to lead it, but to be its protector. So there was a fateful meeting where multiple SLDF generals under Kerensky came to him and personally said, if you want it, it's yours. The entirety of the SLDF basically stood shoulder to shoulder and said, we will support your claim to the Star League if you decide to make it. This was it. This was the moment. And he said no. He did not want to become the leader of the Star League, he didn't believe it was his place, and he believed it would be a betrayal of everything the Star League stood for, so he turned it down. In my opinion, he should have just taken it and lived out the rest of his life as the greatest Chad to have ever lived. I don't know, I'd argue him not taking it makes him even more of a Chad, but... A lot of people do. Ironically enough, a lot of people think that that's like one of the greatest things he's ever done is he was given the universe and he turned it down. I think it's pretty cool, but in hindsight, the effect it caused, not the best. Hey man, hindsight's always 2020. You can't judge based off of that. You gotta judge him in the moment. Fair enough. And that is functionally where the story of Kerensky ends. 
because we've already talked about the Exodus, we've already talked about how everything ended for him, where his story concluded, and if you'd like to see that, we have three videos on it. The Clans, part one, two, and three, talking about the Exodus, finding the Pentagon worlds, and his eventual death and appointment of his son as his successor. Thank you again to our patrons, and I forgot his name, what was it? David Gabe. Thank you, David oh. Gabe, very much. I had to tab Make over to right it, there. man. I had to tab oh, over to it. Give God, me... he doesn't even remember the name of our first guy. Bro, it's it's like the... the, the shut up. Don't care. Stop. No excuse. Cease. Everyone remember to uh, please subscribe, uh, turn on the notification bell. Make sure you get notified when all of our latest videos uh, come out. Oh, dude, uh, follow you're so, you're the, so the bad at this. Over on Twitch. You're uh, so bad at this. Idiot. Well, let me continue on. <laughs> God, you're terrible. You I'm, need you need more more. Go chutzpah. back to the basement. Go. You know what? Yeah, get back to the basement. We'll talk about this later. You need you need more chutzpah and confidence when you do this kind of stuff. So for the outro, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, comment down below, ring the bell button so you'll make sure you'll be notified of all of our future releases. YouTube struggles showing this video to people sometimes, and all of your support is appreciated. If you want to get access to our content a day early with the unedited raw footage, all the rants and jokes that we generally edit out for YouTube, then go to our Patreon, join one of the membership tiers there, either buy me a coffee or feed Steve. Also, please last thing, me. please feed Steve. Last thing before we're done, like officially, hour and a half, yikes. Would you be interested in seeing the crew of Science and Sanity with maybe some of our other friends as well playing video games like Mech Warrior, Star Wars, 40K, all the wonderful sci-fi genres out there with all of their great games? Comments down below, let me know what you think. And if you would be interested in it, do you want it on the main channel or would you prefer a second channel slash Twitch channel where all of that stuff would be contained in isolation? And with that, we are done. Science and Sanity is out. Say goodbye, Steve. Goodbye.